Starting in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Recently, we, we started this series of teachings from the first letter of the Apostle Peter, and we've titled the series, In Transit. And throughout the letter, which you'll see in the weeks to come, there's this consistent theme of how to live our daily lives while we're also waiting on our future. And it's, it's this in transit where we're moving through, we're moving away from what was toward what's coming, and yet we're still in that space in between. So today we're going to finish taking a look at verse 3, not because we're intending to break down every syllable of every verse and spend the next nine years going through First Peter, as fun as that would be. We're not taking our time for that reason. We're taking our time a little bit here at the beginning. The pace feels a little slow, perhaps. Because a few of these phrases are some of the most foundational and necessary Christian ideas that we need for everyday life. It's not my decision that Peter chose to use through the Holy Spirit's leading such ridiculously powerful and necessary truths. So this first part of the letter has moved a little slow. It's why we're five weeks in and only in verse three. The pace will change as the truths spread out, but we need every ounce of what the Apostle Peter gave us in this letter. Last week, we read through the first half of verse three, and it reads like this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now, that's what we read last week. And, and I want to share some things with you. I've heard from some different people and through different conversations this last week that last Sunday and at certain times throughout this last week, God chose to speak very clearly and very uniquely to some individuals in this room and in our church family throughout the week directly in their lives. It was an abrupt interaction with them that the Holy Spirit chose to make that led them to confess some things that they've never confessed, to repent on some things that they've known they needed to turn toward God about or they've known that they've needed to turn to God in, but they never really felt clear movement to do so. And God just took out from underneath them whatever it was they were standing on. And I've got several stories of total renewal that took place last Sunday and this last week because of the things that the Holy Spirit chose to do in the lives of those who availed themselves in those moments. A revival also broke out on the campus of Asbury University this last week. That too was an abrupt interaction of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, it's going on even this very hour, last night, late, Hundreds of students, faculty, members of the local community, and people who have traveled even from here in central Indiana have made their way to Wilmore, Kentucky, 10 minutes south of Lexington, to figure out what is God up to and isn't happening. And all the reports and conversations are, in fact, yes, there are people who are being moved to surrender their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit to the blood of Jesus Christ in a remarkably unique way for this moment one that most skeptics and cynics would agree isn't really going to ever happen again here in the United States. It has been, as one participant and onlooker said, a consistent experience of repentance and confession in worship and prayer. Revivals like this are prayed for and waited for many times with generations passing by while waiting that God might one, one day move. Further still, people are questioning 
are such things like this truly moves of God or are they manipulations of emotion? And the best way to answer that is to perhaps look at the moment and say, is it plausible? Is it plausible that last week through the born again narrative, people in this congregation began to avail themselves in ways that though they've sat in churches for years, allowed themselves to consider maybe there was more unlearning that needed to take place than learning and they actually said yes to something the Holy Spirit moved them to and then they saw breakthrough. Is that possible? The answer is yes, but also it's important for you to remember something as well. It is not a momentary experience that our Heavenly Father is after. This is eternity. And so when the Lord chooses to work in whatever mysterious and unique ways he chooses to work, the one thing we have to keep in mind is our momentary experiences are not the goal. It is eternity at stake. It is eternity the Lord is at work for. It is our souls that the Lord is desiring to save, not our memories. He is redeeming everything. And so whether it's in this moment here at our church family gathering or it is Asbury, Kentucky, or it is anywhere else across the globe, the key thing to recall is this. George Whitfield was once asked following a remarkable revival preaching event where hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people came forward at the end wanting to surrender their lives to Jesus and respond to the gospel. Someone asked him after the event, that was an incredible, incredible experience tonight. How many, do you, how many people do you think got saved tonight? George Whitfield wisely answered, we will see in six months. The Lord is moving, there is zero question. The question is, and we asked this last week, what's happening in you? What is God doing to you? Are things actually breaking open in you? Is peace dwelling? Is hope dwelling? Are you finding security in the grace of God alone, not the confidence of your theology or the history of your church attendance, but in the blood of Jesus alone? Are you standing strong repenting daily, recognizing things in your life are not yet as they ought to be and seeing the good news of Jesus as a better answer than the future you fought for without him. Is he coming into your heart and life? and Is he bringing you joy, real joy? As with all revivals, a time will most likely follow where the lives will begin to go forward. And during this time, patiently move on into the days and years ahead even from Pentecost in Jerusalem all the way until now. We are all in and out of the renewing moments where Jesus arrests our attention and in faith we are graced with the indwelling Holy Spirit. Though the revival event may end, the revival work will not. Today as we look at verse three, I'm gonna ask that you try to see what revival actually brings to your heart, your heart. There are two big questions I want to sort of ask throughout this morning. The first big question is, what does God give us for this life? What does God give us for this life? We're still here. And for most of you, you didn't give your life to Jesus and fall into mansions with armed guards at the gates and a clear mind and and you sleep 16 hours a day and yet you somehow have incredible physiques and your health is the best it's ever been and and that's none of our stories. And yet here we are, redeemed by the blood of Jesus and yet we find our experiences here to still be fraught with challenge. So what does God give us? Does he give us anything? What does he give us for this life? The second question we're gonna answer today from this text what, is, what do we do with it? What does God give us for this life? And the second question is, what do we do with it? What do we do? If I know I've been given something, well, what do we do with it? The first question, what does God give us for this life? First Peter chapter three, we're gonna look at the second part of the verse. It says, he, God, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Last week, we examined John chapter three. Many of you might remember this. And the idea of us having no hope without the new birth. And now we're gonna go on to the rest of the verse, which is very, very much tied to last week. We have been born again to something. Everybody see that? We have been born again. Jesus comes to you and brings new birth and the power of the Holy Spirit, new birth to something. A living hope, it says. 
it's said that hope is this unique thing that we are actually vitally in need of. We can survive for about 40 days, max, in and around 40 days, we can survive without food. We can survive for about seven days, give or take, without water. We can survive for about three minutes without air. We cannot live without hope. Hope is what we have our being moving from. We can do without certain things, but we can't live without hope. Hope is an anchor for our soul. Hope is not wishful thinking. And suffering, then, is the experience of needing hope to come through. Suffering is the experience that we have where hope is needed in order to endure. Some of you have faced incredible loss. Some of you are standing in the middle of it now, and some of you are fearful of its soon approach. And yet, we know, all of us know, that our hope had better come through. Otherwise, this ground gets really shaky really fast. And that metaphor applies all over our lives. There's a, an understanding about optimism, and it's this. Hope is not passive optimism. Pie in the sky, Pollyanna ideas. It's not. That doesn't hold up. What hope is, is it's an active confidence. It's an inner confidence that carries through difficult things. It doesn't move or waver much. It has the ability to sustain. Hope is gloriously beautiful when we have it. Real hope. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of James Stockdale. He was the highest ranked naval officer ever imprisoned in North Vietnam. And he famously explored the necessity of hope during his eight years of torture-filled captivity from 1965 to 1973. What he learned was that sentimental or unfounded hope, what he labeled as optimism, doesn't work. He was asked later which prisoners didn't make it. In his eight years of enduring these hardships, which prisoners weren't able to make it through? Which are the ones who seemed least likely to hold on? He said, oh, that's easy. The optimists. They were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and Christmas would go. Then they would say, we're going to be out by Easter. And then Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving and then, just like that, it was Christmas again. And they died of a broken heart every time. What we hope in, church, affects everything in our lives. Hope isn't just a category. It's underneath all of our categories. What we hope in and how we appropriate that hope is what we live by every single day of our lives. I hope over the next few minutes that gets really crystal clear for you, both to see what you actually hope in and also what you've been given that works. Because chances are for some of you, your hope has been good for a little while until certain experiences have shown up and then the ground got shaky and then you started to kind of step back and question a little bit. You pushed pause on all the hand raising and singing. You kind of said, wait, 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 wait. And then, then maybe you step back in a little bit and you, you start to question, is the thing that I hope in most really going to come through? Does it really have the power? Am I really going to be okay? Everybody with me? Or am I the only one that experiences these things? Because if so, then, then I'll just take these notes back to my office. I'm good. I want you to see how much hope really does matter. People with high hope have goals, a plan to achieve their goals, and the motivation to pursue the plan. Academic research confirms that higher hope individuals have greater satisfaction with their life, better coping skills, a buffer for anxiety, and a greater sense of meaningful experiences in their life. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Viktor Frankl wrote a book um, titled Man's Search for Meaning. He was a survivor of the Holocaust concentration camps. In the book, he noted that the character of individuals who lacked godly hope turned ugly and awful as soon as the pressure was turned up in their life. 
Many of you experience this. And a lot of times when we, we see somebody give their life to Jesus, one of the soon things that we'll do afterwards is we'll kind of increase our, our conversational and relational equity with them is because what we know is the more you step out in faith, it seems like the enemy starts to perk up and, and comes after you a little bit. And one of the things you see in your Christian life is every time God calls you to trust him more, to give some sort of new phrase of obedience to your heart, the enemy sort of, sort of rises up out of nowhere and just kind of clouds all of your confidence. And then all of a sudden you're, you're fearful. What he wants you to do is he wants you to retreat. And he wants you to just step away from that whole follow the Lord thing. And he wants you to just go back to your normal, complacent, lazy, you know, suburban life that we got, right? That's what he's after. Yeah, you can say you have faith all day, just don't demonstrate it. Don't live by it. Don't stand on it. Don't execute it. Talk it, yes. You can even have gatherings, fill the room, sing the songs, turn the lights on. Look for new parking, pave that parking, have a great time, just don't live by it. So we, we find spaces that are safe enough to talk about it, but avoid the spaces that desire us to walk in it. And what Peter gives to the exiles is there's no such thing. What we have here, there's no such thing. Speaking of these things will only move us away from him, not into him. So, Victor Frankl noticed that people's character, the who they are, when the pressure turned up, they suffered immeasurably. But those who had godly hope, real hope in God, persevered in ways that cannot be measured. It was unfathomable, unfathomable to him. That word's harder than I thought. Anyway, <laughs> Victor Frankl wrote it as a book. He said, the foundation of your character is not your personality type. The foundation of your character is your hope. want to say that again. The foundation of your character, how you show up when nobody's looking, the foundation of your character is found in your hope. Who you are comes from what you hope in more than you can imagine. So this statement sets up a good question. If the foundation of your character is your hope, then church at Maine, everybody look at me. What is the actual operating hope that you live in? What is the actual foundation of your hope? At the beginning of last year, beginning of 2022, 84% of surveyed American adults stated that they were either extremely or at least very worried about the immediate future. Hope was very difficult for 84% of surveyed adults. In a Pew Research poll, most participants agreed that they find their only sense of meaning in this life and their only hold for hope from things like family, career, and friendships. All of these bring a possible heightened sense of security and stability to these people's lives. It adds stability to their daily experiences. So here's the problem with that, though. The problem is that all of us know that every single one of those things that we hope in, they don't confront our greatest fear and our greatest concern in this life. They don't even touch it. That's great that I can be surrounded with a good career, friends and family. I'm still going to die. Why do I have to die? Why do we have to go through this suffering this way? Phil Robertson, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Duck Dynasty or not. Um, are we going to have church now? <laughs> if I grow this out, folks, are you going to love me? Like, what, where's that going? No, that's a no. Bro, I got a marriage to hold up. This is, you're not the only vote. Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty once said in an interview while sharing his testimony that all of these moral transformations that were taking place by following Jesus, they are in fact life-changing. But at the end of the day, none of those moral transformations by themselves can do anything about the fact that he's still going to end up in a six-foot hole in the ground. And that there's nothing that can be, and if there's nothing that can be done about that, then maybe moral transformation isn't worth it in the end. See, something has to deal with the real reality of our eternal fate and our experiences here in this life. 
The reason exile is so difficult is because we all truly treasure our lives. We love our lives and we fight for the vitality we find in our lives, don't we? It's why we gravitate so rapidly to comfort and it's why we hold on so tightly to things that we know don't matter that much, but oh, they make things here so much better, at least better than they were before when these things weren't in our hands so tightly. Everybody with me? And this is what we recognize in our hearts and it translates into everything else in our lives. Our lives are a precious gift and the longer we reflect on that idea, the more confident we are that this life is absolutely to be treasured. And I would argue that hope and treasure are intimately connected, two sides of one coin. We should treasure our lives. So I'm gonna ask you, this question needs to raise up throughout your time this week. We're gonna probably hit this on the Midweek at Main video as well. Like this is, this is something to hold out in front of you and really reflect on and be honest about. What is your personal living hope? What is your greatest treasure? You, each individual in this room and those of you joining us online, what is your actual greatest treasure? I know in this room, remember we've done this, I know what the words are gonna sound like, but what do you actually hold in your heart as the true treasure? The stability of that thing that you're thinking of right now, its security and stability in your life is what most of your anxieties and most of your behaviors and most of your life rhythms are built around to support and to protect. Maybe your deepest treasure is your family. Maybe your deepest treasury, treasure is your, your childhood or your adulthood or your future or your retirement or your reputation or your whatever, I'd, whatever the things are. Where that treasure though is, that's what you're operating from living as an exile follower of Jesus while also identifying what that treasure is, deep down in your heart, that is where you will find your challenges growing most clear. Places where your treasure butts up against your experiences. Peter here in verse three tells us that we have been caused by God to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The hope that God plants within us, his children, comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What our scriptures teach is that the hope for the Christian centers on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This concept is not only for Easter Sunday sermons. Surprise. The whole thing falls apart if the resurrection didn't happen. The reason Peter can encourage these churches by reminding them of the living hope that's been placed within them is because hope is in fact living right now. This hope didn't die on the cross. This hope raised from the dead. This hope is still living. This hope is active. This hope is able. And this hope is with us. And if we live from that space, now all of a sudden the other things that tempt us and bother us don't actually have power. Because none of those things can speak and raise things that were once dead into life. How? We fear suffering, death, and our futures. We do. We fear it. We may not say it, but when the news comes, the diagnosis comes for our beloved. I've got a friend right now who I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be around. He's not a part of our church family, but he's somebody I've known for a long time. He's, he's kind of giving up. He is older. He's been through a lot. He doesn't have the hope to sustain him to carry through whatever's in front of him. He's losing hope because the reality is that he was living for most of his life on a hope that was never gonna get him the results he was looking for. And that, that reality setting in this late in life is absolutely demolishing his joy. He's lost all hope. Why? Because all the hope he had was dead hope. It wasn't living hope. And the wrestling with this man and the wrestling with each one of us is that we get off of the things that are poisoning us and stand firm on the things that bring life. There is no hope outside of the resurrection. Suffering occurs when our experiences lead to a lack of shalom. Life as it should be, most. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ goes 
well beyond a, a sermon outline for Easter Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus Christ explodes the empty hopes that we normally rely on because it happened to inaugurate and activate the presence of the kingdom of God visibly overcoming death permanently. So what has God given us for this life? He has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So next question then is, what do we do with it? What has God given for us in this life? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do we do with it? One of Jesus' most powerful parables is also one of his shortest. In our scripture, it's just one verse but it's the center of how you're going to go forward as an exile. If you want to turn there, you can, but again, it's one verse. I'm going to have it up on the screen. I'm going to read it here. It's Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. One of the most profound parables that Jesus ever teaches, it's literally this short though. And the reason it's so profound, and I want you to think with me for a minute. Just think about this. What do you think this guy was thinking about that morning when he got up for breakfast? I can't wait to go out and just rummage through somebody's field, find something, and then sell our house right out from underneath my wife and kids. They're like, honey, I bought this pile of dirt. We don't even know what the man owned, but we know that whatever he owned, he didn't seem that bent out of shape to get rid of. What do you think was going through his mind that morning? Do you think this guy was actively running around treasure hunting? No, he wasn't. Let's go back 15 minutes before. Think, think with me, church. 15 minutes before this man discovers the treasure, the thought of him selling all that he owned to buy that field would have been the stupidest and most foolish idea that could have crossed his mind. It would have gotten him removed from his family. No doubt his wife would have left him. His kids would have laughed at him. His boss would have fired him. The society around him would have completely ostracized him. This guy would now move from normal property owner, farmer guy, or whatever it was he did, to village idiot, like that. All right? So just putting on his plate, 15 minutes before this guy finds this treasure, he looks like us. Going through the motions, doing the things, clocking in keeping up the images as best he can. Then something happens. 15 minutes later, he's walking down the road. 15 minutes after finding the treasure, he's off to sell everything he owns. Church, think, think with me. Jesus is talking to his disciples in a larger crowd, and he's talking to them, and he's saying, listen, there's a guy. There's a guy who's just like you. One day, he's walking around, doing the normal stuff that you and I do. He's probably, you know, good guy. Did good things for people. Maybe he had some bad days, but he was, he was just like us. But then he found something. He found this treasure. It was hidden. It wasn't visible. He found it. And when he found it, his world turned upside down. For whatever reason, every single reputation in his life vanished. Every single opinion that the most endearing members of his life and his family and his loves had for him vanished. Every job security he ever had vanished. College degrees, gone. Future plans, gone. Everything in his life mattered zero now. Jesus is talking to people like you and me, and he is saying the kingdom of heaven, the full available eternal life with God, the plan for your future is like this treasure. And this guy finds it, and when he finds it, nothing else matters. He runs off with joy, not confusion, not even false hope. He runs off with certain joy. and He sells everything he owns to buy that field. I need you to understand this. We don't know what the field was worth. He doesn't care. He pays everything to buy it. There isn't anything he owns that he needs to keep. It's all gone. Everybody follow me. 
This man has found something that is totally transforming his entire existence. Jesus is the kingdom of heaven being discovered has this effect on your heart. When you discover what God has done for you, this is the response that makes sense. The treasure restructured this man's entire outlook on everything. His marriage, his job, his plans, all changed, altered immediately because of this treasure. By following this. Because if we go to church on Sundays, we have nice little warm, fuzzy experiences. We don't understand that God is not telling us we ought to sell. He's confused at why we haven't already jumped at the chance to. He's looking at us and he's like, what do you still need to hold on here that you believe is even remarkably going to comfort you the way that I am? And how do you seriously expect to win souls to the kingdom when you are barely hanging on to the beauty that you say you have? This is huge. This, Jesus is telling his followers, look, it doesn't make sense to keep some stuff behind. It doesn't make sense to even look at anything you have. This is everything. And when you treat it like just a thing, you'll have nothing. And that's his point. He's reiterating to this church, you don't have a living hope if you don't recognize this resurrection is enormous. There is nothing in all of creation that can counter what God has done in Jesus Christ. Nothing. Our lives here don't produce that. And you look around and you know that's already true. He did this with joy. The treasure you treasure is the hope from which you actually live. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? And do you believe that you're next? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's not going to be up on the screens. I want to read it to you from my scriptures up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to start in verse 1 and read to verse 23. The Apostle Paul writes this church that he's been back and forth with. He says, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel, the good news I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then It was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not Christ has even been raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Jesus Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. and You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, they've perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. This is what Phil Robertson was talking about. If we have Jesus for this only, and all we do is have gatherings and change maybe the way we dress and talk a little bit and give something for, you know, some concerts to have and some musicians to do and some people to stand in doorways and greet you and have awkward introverted, extroverted exchanges. If that's our ceiling, then we are idiots and we are the most to be pitied. If this is all we've got, this isn't enough. Then Paul's in a complete agreement. If Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, y'all look dumb.
Verse 20. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. As by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to him. Church, the word first fruits matters. See, Lazarus was raised from the dead, it's true. But he died again. I have friends in India that have seen things they can't unsee, yet those people's eyes will no longer work and they will find a grave. We will all fall asleep. That is what is spoken of here. But falling asleep is not the end of the story. And this is why this verbiage matters. But in Christ, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits. There's more to come, church. This is our living hope through the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus has risen from the dead, our hope is not in our circumstances or our experiences here, but instead our hope is anchored in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is our entrance into the kingdom, our treasure in the field. Our story isn't here anymore. Our lives here are not what make us who we are with him anymore. This is the expression and the vehicle through which we celebrate the marvelous light that has entered our lives. And that means that we don't hold on to the things that are here because they only hold us down. We hold on to the cross. We hold on to heaven. We stay there. Our minds are there. We are saturated there. We are patient there. And we have our lives and our being here. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. I'll have it up on the screens. goes like this. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a what? Forerunner on our behalf. What are the living things that are not actually living that claim our hearts instead of this resurrection future that we are promised and we are guaranteed? The resurrection is your life and it is your future, not the stock market. The resurrection is your future and it is your life not the reputation you carry from your past or the reputation you're trying to clean up and prepare for the future. The resurrection is your future and it is your life, not the wars of governments or the status of nations. The resurrection is your future and it is your life, not the comforts of your time here. Our treasure in a field is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and through that we have a living and sustaining hope that God does always keep his promises And through faith alone, this promise is yours forever. In a moment, we're going to take communion. I'm going to ask for the kids to go ahead and make their way back in. And then communion is a unique experience I want to talk to you for a minute about. A lot of you know that this moment in our worship service is a shift, right? The kids enter, and so you kind of, this is where you check your phone. Go ahead and do it. This is where you try to decide how long is the rest of this going to go? Are they going to sing a little more? Yeah, we might. Is Drew going to take another? Is this him landing the plane, which really means he's going to circle the tower for the next half an hour? (laughs) Right? This is where we're at. So I just want to, I see you, you see me, we're good, okay? But communion, celebrating the Lord's Supper, We used to do this once a month, and we moved it to once a week. And in light of the current affairs, in light of the world around us, it seemed fitting for us to remember Jesus better and better and better. That if we're going to move each other closer to Jesus every time we gather, then every time we gather, we should do everything we can to move each other closer to Jesus. Coming to this table is a remarkable way of getting closer to Jesus. Would you agree? On the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and I would argue betrayed by all, he gathered with his disciples to celebrate something. Do you know what it was? Ed, thank you. The Passover feast. Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover feast. Now, I'm going to ask, 
If you've been thinking about how does the resurrection work? How do I actually have, how do I face this really bad news in my life? How do I face the fact that I'm stubborn to grow and slow to move and slow to trust? How do I face the fact that whatever my past says about me still seems to mean too much to me? If you're still wrestling with how, then I want you to hear this. Back in Egypt, the Passover feast, God's people were told to take a spotless lamb and sacrifice it. They were told to take a spotless lamb and sacrifice that lamb, to cook and to eat its meat and to take its blood and place the blood on the lintel of the door. Everybody know the story? So the goal was to take the blood and put it on the lintel of the door, to gather inside the home, to eat this meat specifically, this spotless lamb that they had sacrificed. And then by doing that, the angel of death would pass over their home, sparing them from losing their firstborn. Now, I want you to imagine something with me for a second, church. Okay? I still have everybody's attention. I want you to imagine something with me for a moment, okay? I want you to imagine that there are two different families in Egypt that night. Okay? Everybody picture this? Two different families. Let's say they're neighbors on the same block in Egypt. Two different families. You picturing this? One family has immeasurable confidence that night. They are completely steadfast, resolute in their faith that this news is going to save their firstborn. And they eat the meat and they use the blood and they put it on the door and they go on just content. The other family, the other family looks at its faith as being too small. They're filled with doubt. In their mind, they're hopeful it's going to work, but in their heart, they're still not sure. They're, they're trying their best that night. So they eat the meat and they put the blood on the door, but in their hearts, they're still like, ah, I'm not sure. I believe God loves us. It's been 430 years. I believe God wants to rescue us. I believe, I believe, but I'm still wrestling. So you got two families, one that is completely yes and amen. God's gonna come through. This is the way, blood on the doorpost, no problem. You've got another family that's doing the same things. They're putting their faith in the same place. It's just their faith feels a little less. Am I with me? Let me ask you a question then. Between those two families, everybody hear this. Between these two families, I want you to compare them side by side. Which one that night lost its firstborn to the angel of death? Neither. The answer is that neither one lost anything that night. Because the Passover of the angel of death was not determined by the measure of their faith in the household, but was determined by the blood of the spotless lamb. That alone saved them. It was the blood of the lamb that deterred the angel of death and provided the structure for the promise of that family. You are not saved by the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith. And that object is the living Jesus Christ who is raised from the dead. Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And later in 1 Peter chapter 3, we will read that the resurrection is the culmination of the gospel. It is the culmination of the good news of what God has done. It is the gateway to the kingdom of heaven that we walked about, talked about, learned about, and listened to last week and will every week. According to the great mercy, God, the Father, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is your faith in that Jesus alone that will bring you in the kingdom forever and ever. This is your living hope, not your circumstances, your feelings, your experiences, but the blood of the Lamb is your hope and he has risen from the dead. There is no more death to fear. Everybody with me? So you're not going to worry about the old things anymore. Your anxieties aren't being needed here anymore. Your power is in Christ alone. So here's what that means. Your loved ones will leave. They will fall asleep. But whether your experience with their faith has been like, I hope, I hope, I hope, or there's no question, is irrelevant. It is the blood alone that will see them through. It is the blood alone that will see you through. It is the blood alone that will see any who have faith, whether it's small or giant. It is God alone in his mercy who has acted, not us. So then, it isn't on you to save you. Therefore, you are free to walk in the 
grace of God instead of demonstrating without him the power you think that you need. He has come through for you. And he's never not going to. Everything in your life can belong to him. Your money, your future, your job, everything is fine because of him. Because the resurrection is your future. Nothing else needs to be now. So you're free to be up and down. Do your best. Find weaknesses. Point them out. Run to the cross. And remember, resurrection is coming. And in that resurrection, we will be in a foot race to our king with arms wide open, ready to receive the weakest and the strongest of us all because his blood said so. Ed Ed Lightfoot came came up to me this morning. Ed, would you be willing to stand? Would everybody applaud that? Stay standing. We're going to take communion. No, no, I'm sorry. I meant for you to stay standing. Now this is, applaud again, because that's, stay. So Ed and Matt, would you stand up? Everybody say hi to Matt Holtman for me. Matt's going through a really tough time. We're going to pray for him right now. Matt's father is getting ready to walk this out. Yes? Matt's father is getting ready to pursue the resurrection at a faster pace than it would seem you and I might be. The word Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, the word literally means in the Greek to stand up. Ed, in the last year, would you say your life went from being dead and dormant to now standing up? Now in October, Ed had a surgery, a magnificent, debilitating back surgery. The reason I wanted you to clap for Ed standing today is because he walked in here without a cane. Because he's raised now. So here's what I want you to do, Church at Maine. We're going to pray for Matt and his family because Matt's home from Iraq. To gently say goodbye to his father. And then he's going to go back to Iraq and finish his work while God continues to finish his. Ed came in here without a cane. I'm going to ask you to leave here without yours. I'm going to ask you the deacons come forward and our worship team makes their way up here in a few moments after we take the Lord's table together. I want you to look like Ed. You've been through a lot. It's ter- torn you apart. You have failed in countless ways. Ed, Ed has fallen. Ed has exhausted his resources, otherwise known as Cindy, around him. <clears throat> <laughs> and yet, by the grace of God, here you stand. And Matt, we're going to be doing this with your dad for millions of years, remembering the grace of God on our lives through the hardships we faced and the exile we walked. Whether we look like Ed, we look like you, it is Christ alone who will come through. So church, I'm gonna invite you to stand and pray. We're gonna pray over Ed and we're gonna pray over Matt right now and then we're gonna take the Lord's table together. Heavenly Father, one day we will stand out of the grave be resurrected fully and finally in glorified bodies because your future is a new heaven and a new earth for this will pass away. So Father, we pray now for Matt. We ask you strengthen him immeasurably. Give him wisdom and deep, powerful moments of joy and celebration with Margaret, the kids, the family. Lord, we praise you for rescuing his dad's brother this last week by allowing him to receive your gospel through Matt's dad's proclaiming of it. We ask God that you use Matt's dad and exhaust him in these final hours to give him great strength to continue to live in light of the gospel. And we pray for Matt to be bold and yet tender and gentle in these hours. And we ask you, God, to give us, your church, the wisdom and the access to care for his family while he's home, to make sure that their needs are met, their opportunities are available, Father, for them to love and live well in this time before he returns to the hardships of Iraq and the work ahead. God, we pray for Ed and his glorious return to a life he's never known, 
a life where you are his king, you are dwelling in his heart more and more every day. And we ask you to continue to strengthen Cindy and the family and all those in our church now who are laboring in exhaustion as exiles. God, you are our living hope that we have through the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is in his name we pray together, amen.